played and have fun, no time to wait. Open up your mind with marks, pencils, or paints. Hear what they have made. Savannah, Russell, and Jane with a podcast just for you. It's time for Fabrush. Artists with a lot to say. It's Fabrush. Listen, it'll make your day. No my medication late so i should should be on it um yeah though my notes are all over the place dude like i was like doing stuff right up to the point i started typing them out oh my god there are in all in here so like i'm gonna be all over the place (gasps) hi jade hi you're lagging Uh uh-oh is that or you're just holding the same expression you're not lagging for me okay Hi, Jade. Hi. <laughs> I see you started the party. <laughs> I did. What well, is that? Sh- Shiner Oktoberfest. Ooh. Is it good? Oh, it's so good. I've been buying it for like two weeks now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, Bryce just got a bunch of Oktoberfest stuff, but like that stuff's not really my jam, so I haven't had any of it. Mm. Well, I like the Shiner Oktoberfest because it's it's it still mostly tastes like Shiner. But yeah. it's got a little bit, it's a little bit heavier, not too heavy though. Cause I know a lot of those Oktoberfest beers can get really heavy. Yeah. Ugh. I just like regular Shiner. I also like regular Shiner. Mm-hmm. That's like my go to beer. If restaurants have it and I want a beer, that's what I get. Yeah. Or like if I go out drinking with friends and stuff and there's not like, cause usually I'm just like a hard liquor and juice kind of guy. Like, give me yeah. a vodka cranberry or vodka uh oj yeah screwdriver yes though meh like i'm more towards i think my favorite drink is vodka and pineapple juice that's what i drink a lot of huh oh i mean uh screw you can't go wrong with a screwdriver so yeah i drink a lot of vodka pineapples in guatemala to have like one or two and just be like okay i'm done and everybody else like at the hostel or wherever we were they're just like why aren't you drinking so much and i was like i see what you're like in the morning (laughs) no thanks like i also have to walk through antigua at midnight by myself and i don't want to do that drunk (laughs) right stones are not not friendly to my ankle you're not friendly to drunk people either. <laughs> Man, it was so sad. There was like one time I was walking home from one of the bars and there was this guy, a local that was being carried by his family to the bus wow. stop because he was so just like torched. Oh, yeah. It was, I was just like, oh, ugh. oh, no. Bummer. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no, <laughs> no, no. How's y'all's day going? It's good. Um. I painted in my therapy art book today, so. Nice. Yeah. I've been Very working nice. on projects and mostly stuff for this podcast, but <laughs> I decided to read a whole book in like two days. Gosh. Oh my God. No, no. I, what is was wrong recently. with you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay. I'll tell you how I did it though. I cheated because I, I got it on Audible and then I like used the two times, like listen at twice the speed thing so it's just like <laughs> fast forward it like the parts that i wanted to hear i like slowed it down so i could take notes but like the stuff that i was like i don't really care i don't really care this is fluff this is background i don't need it i just like <laughs> the guy was starting to sound like a gerbil like getting <laughs> like, up his voice but yeah who was the who was the uh or orator for the book the, uh narrator there we go that's the word i swear i'm smart <laughs> you're like jeopardy smart Oh my god. <laughs> John Allen Nielsen. Okay, no, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. He did a good job though. <laughs> oh, okay. Well there's I, I do a lot of audible books and stuff, so I've got I've got like a top three narrators. Uh well it's kind of an obscure book, so it was probably some just some dude. <laughs> Just some some dude. dude. Yeah. I've got to say, the narrator for the Harry Potter books is actually really great too. What's his name? Okay, so for the American Audible version, it's Jim Dale, but for the British version, they get Stephen Fry. Nah. Did what? you like? So can you like choose like when you go to buy it? Can you like? Nope. <gasps> 
Stephen Fry is available in Britain only. What? Yeah. So I bet if you have like one of those like VPN things or whatever, where you can like jump around from country to country, you could probably buy it. But I mean, the Jim Dale guy, he does a great job anyway. So it's not like it's it's super terrible. But I it's it honestly, you need a good narrator for the Harry Potter books. Otherwise, you ruin the whole thing. Wish it was Stephen Fry, but that's fine. Well, it is just not here in our country. I bet you can find a bootleg of it somewhere. Or maybe oh, I'm yeah. sure. on YouTube. Not that we I, encourage that here on the Fan Brush Podcast. I just <laughs> want to hear a clip of it. That's all I'm saying. I want to hear like what he sounds like reading Harry Potter. Yeah, right. That would be cool. Although, I, I'm very angry with What's-Her-Face. J.K. Rowling? Yeah, being a turf. Yeah, she's problematic, but... I, to be fair, I bought the Audible books before she was a problem. <laughs> so Is that a gas behind you? Yeah, I tried to take it out of the room before we started recording, but she just ran from me. And yeah, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> now she's sitting on the back of my chair, which I knew was going to happen. But I was like, maybe she'll gas. just be good and sit somewhere. Gas. But yeah, she refused to let me catch her. And then you guys were like, it, we're, we're doing it. I'm like, okay, fine. She'll behave. She hasn't been doing anything all day but sleeping. But of course, now she's doing this. <laughs> Sorry. I love that cat. Yeah, she's great. She does. <laughs> anytime I sleep on your couch, she does that crap to me too. Because she'll lay on my chest and nuzzle my chin and meow at me until I wake up and pet her. And then whenever I start petting her, she's just like, all up in my my neck and just like cuddling and just like oh yes give me attention yeah she's a jerk i'll never forget when i was watching your apartment while y'all were in disney world and i i was sleeping in y'all's bed and i woke up the next morning to gaz and squeaksy laying on my face yeah <laughs> like just straight up just both of them laid across my face and i was just like I mean, there are worse ways to wake up, I guess. <laughs> uh, Squeaksy would attack my feet sometimes because I, I kick in my sleep. <laughs> she was like, quit it. <laughs> and so like Gaz, Gaz usually would lay on my chest and Squeaksy would be like in between my legs or in the nook of my knees. And anytime I'd start kicking and stuff, like all of a sudden I feel this like patter, patter, patter. <laughs> Patter, patter. And I'm just like, what is that? And I'd start kicking it and I'd hear Squeaksy go, Meh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to so cool. actually take her out. because No, I like the meows. <sighs> okay. It's great. I love Gaz. It's ambiance. She's part of the podcast now. Let's oh, yeah. Should we introduce ourselves in the podcast now? <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Savannah. I like art. <laughs> Hi, I'm Russell. I like art. My name is Jade, and I'm going to go out of limb here and say that I also like art. I'm going to call bullshit on that. I'll fight you. <gasps> Does that mean I get to see you in person? <laughs> or are we going to fight with, with uh, like, 10-foot poles because of social distancing? Oh, it'll be a Facebook fight because oh. of COVID. Yeah. No, I was hoping to see you in person be able to hit you with a stick. Just be like, <laughs> bop, 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 bop. It's like climatic. <laughs> <laughs> Just smack, smack. I miss hitting nerds with sticks. Oh, what she's. Oh, well, like I, I, I larp, and so yeah. we take foam bats and we go out into the woods and pretend it's the zombie apocalypse and hit each other for fun. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So, what are we covering today? So today, uh, Russell and I have prepared a song and dance. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which you won't be able to to see uh, on the podcast. So <laughs> instead, we're gonna be. Uh, Talking about some art crimes. Art like, crime. Uh, originally, when I had like thought of doing like an art podcast, I thought it would be neat to like do art crimes since I think it's really kind of crazy that people are willing to like steal art and commit crimes for art. I haven't found one yet, but I'm sure somebody's killed somebody over a piece of art, and I just think it's fascinating that people like put that much value into like paint on canvas or whatever. <laughs> Well, there are some serial killers that are artists. Okay. <laughs> John Wayne Gacy. He, he yeah. started painting in, in prison. Oh, yeah. I did hear about that. Yeah. he paint, But that wasn't like before while he was... Murdering. M- m- murdering. Murder. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we thought we'd switch it up and uh, do a little research, which is why I read an entire book in like 
two days. Um, so me and Russell, we don't know what uh, the other one is researched. We kind of gave hints uh, of what it was just so we wouldn't do the same thing. Because Bryce is useless. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. Did you ask him? He had no idea what I was doing. I did ask him because like I had, I've changed it up a few times what I was doing. And at first I was just like, yes, I'm going to do this and it's going to be great. And so I text Bryce. I'm just like, hey, what is Savannah doing for the podcast? Is she doing this? And he's like, I don't know. I'm like, okay, like, can you find out? And he's like, why don't you text her? And I'm just like, well, I don't want her to know what I'm doing. And I don't want to know what she's doing. I want it to be a surprise. And he's like, okay. (laughs) that sounds just like bryce (laughs) like help me out man and so i called up savannah i was just like hey (laughs) can you give me a hint (laughs) of what you're doing because i'm thinking about doing this and she's just like well uh, uh, i can say this and so she kind of like hints at what she's gonna do I was like, okay, no, 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 that's not what I'm going to do. And then earlier today, I found something else while I was looking up research stuff for the previous thing that I'm not going to do that I might do later. Yay, vague enough to work. (laughs) All right. Well, I'm telling you right now, mine is like super long. Like, so. Mine might be. uh, (laughs) Mine is not long because I did no research because I didn't want to. (laughs) It's just long for the ride. She's she's commentary, which I'm okay with because it's like telling a story. All right. Well, who wants to go first? Well, it's usually me. (laughs) Did you just volunteer? Did you just volunteer to go first? Like, if I didn't volunteer, would you have made me go first? I would have asked if you wanted to. (laughs) No, see that? That wouldn't be volunteer. That would be voluntold. <laughs> Russell, you're going first, right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can go first. I never go first. So if you want me to go first, I can go first. I don't mind. Uh, For one. For a thing. I guess Jade can pick. Who do you want to go first? Yeah. Who, yeah, who Jade, pick. Like? Who's your favorite? Who? Who? Who's your favorite? Who? who is it? I don't have a favorite, <laughs> I don't have a favorite but <laughs> let's, let's break tradition and have Savannah go first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Savannah's your favorite, I see. Okay. All right, all right, all right. So, <laughs> for my art crime piece, I researched something called the Ghent Altarpiece. Have, have you guys ever heard of it? I have not. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. So, the Ghent Altarpiece, it is it is like a, a triptych, but, like, it's a polytych, because it's, like, a triptych has, like, three things, and it, like, opens up, like, like this, like it has wings or whatever. Like this, uh, using your hands on a podcast. That's <laughs> I'm a sure audio. <laughs> like um, this. Like yes. This. Oh my gosh. Yes, totally. I'm so glad that our listeners totally know what you're talking about. Well, I'm it kind of looks like you're just doing like open door jazz hands or something. <laughs> like jazz hands. I'm gonna put pictures up and links up on our Instagram so people can who want to go like look at it can go look at it because so is it like one of those old jewelry boxes that have like the double doors that open up? Yes, it's exactly like that. Awesome. Oh, so it's a Dybbuk box. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's twelve. It's a twelve panel, fifteenth century Flemish painting, and it's eleven feet tall by fifteen feet wide. Yes. And it it is attributed to Jan van Eyck and also to his brother Hubert or Uber van Eyck. Huh? <laughs> Said your Uber is here. <laughs> so they began it in, in the mid 1420s and they completed it sometime before 1432. So it took like a while to complete. Um, so it was it was commissioned for the St. Bavos Cathedral in Ghent, Belgium, as part of like a larger project for the cathedral and it was commissioned by like a husband and wife who paid a lot of money and as a result they're actually like painted into the piece of art when the doors are closed um they're in the bottom panels praying to their patron saints and it was like common kind of back then for people to, like give money to the church in mm-hmm. hopes that it would help them like get into heaven so that's kind of what they were doing i don't like when i was reading about this i was like Man, can you imagine being like so conceited? Just like, here's some money, immortalize me in art, and make me look like super pious. Like that's what these people did. Oh which my I think, god! Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, I mean, it doesn't surprise me because it seems like it seems like a lot of the time that was just like an excuse to be extremely sinful, and then it's like, oh well, it's no big deal because I can just pay the ferryman and get into heaven. So, right? 
in some ways I'm disgusted by it. When I, and in other ways I'm like, well, that's kind of baller. Like <laughs> you right. have money it must be nice to have money. Right. <laughs> So the painting includes figures, uh, religious figures, including the Virgin Mary, Christ the King, John the Baptist, choruses of angels. Adam and Eve are on separate panels, like opposing panels. And in the bottom, it's got, it's like a lamb, like the sacrificial lamb, which is supposed to represent Jesus. And he's chilling there in the middle and all like the saints and martyrs and, and sinners and soldiers and a bunch of people are like looking in on him and like being like ooh and on it's just there's a lot to the painting but it's like super beautiful it was painted in oils and it has gold gleefing and it was originally had oh like gosh. a really cool frame with a bunch of like ornate tracery and stuff but it was like lost sometime um between all the stuff that happened to it and it was thought to have had mechanical parts that would actually like open up the panels automatically what? yeah wow but all that stuff is lost. It's not, that's all gone. It's basically just in wooden frames now. So it was usually closed most of the time, but it was opened for like holidays and special occasions. And actually right now you can go see it. And I think they said that it was closed during the week, but if you go see it on the weekend, they have it open. It's Saturday. Open the painting. <laughs> <laughs> that's some Banksy shit right there. Right. It, it's considered the bridge between medieval art and Renaissance art. Because Ooh. it's regarded as like the first large scale oil painting and also for its depictions of naturalistic landscapes and backgrounds. Because usually before that, it was more flat, but he gives a lot of depth to his characters and to the backgrounds. Nice. Uh, and also before this, like tempura paint was like the medium that most people were using. I hate Ugh. tempura. Oil paint. Actually <laughs> I'm glad lot. we're all on the same page of that. It's like, yeah, Ugh. tempura paint was made and everybody goes, Ugh, I, I. <laughs> I'm hemorrhaging. I hate tempura <laughs> paint. <laughs> You know what's funny is to me tempura paint. I just I always think about like what they gave you in kindergarten to paint with in those big <laughs> bottles. You know? Yeah. You don't think about that smells people, funky. But you don't think about like people glue. painting like whole masterpieces with it. You know? <sighs> Ugh. Anyways. <laughs> well, they're probably also using a different technique to make the paint instead of just like powder plastic and a shit ton of water. That's true. Uh, another piece of information that I found is at this time it was like super rare for an artist to paint anything if it wasn't by commission because of the cost of painting materials. Fun facts. From the time this painting started, it would be another 200 years before artists started painting just pictures and the hopes of finding a buyer for the paintings and another 400 years before paint would become commercially available in like tubes. Otherwise, like artists would have to make their paint on their own or have their like their assistants make it. That's what that's kind of like what I was talking about last week about like all those toxic chemicals that they would put in yeah. paint back in the day and like pee and like all that other gross shit. Oh, yeah. 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 I think uh Rain. Maybe you said it too, but like the the most expensive one was the blue. With the um, I think the most expensive one was it's like some kind of purple because they crushed up or not crushed up snails, but they used like some some part of the of snails. But it would cost it would it was so expensive because it would take so many snails. It would take thousands of snails to make this one tube. Uh, so yeah. Great. Yeah, so so basically, Ooh. artists couldn't be, afford to like make their own art unless somebody else paid for it, which is crazy to me. Okay, so I understand now, that struggle. Right? <laughs> yeah, you think art, art supplies are expensive now? Well, <laughs> that's the real art crime. So this painting, this uh, yeah. triptych, has been linked to thirteen known crimes throughout wow. the time that it's existed. What? But, yeah. Uh, so the first crime reportedly supposes. So there's a lot of conspiracy conspiracy theories around the painting as well and some of this allegedly stuff, alleged yeah some of it's never been proven but the suspected first crime may have been the forgery of a signature attributing the painting to the brother hubert they don't know if it's actually a signature or if somebody added it later they mm. but they're thinking it probably is real so who knows so like for the first 140 years that the painting was in the church everything was cool with it like nothing bad <laughs> happened to it it was cool and then, like, in 1566, there was a group of Protestants known as the Calvinists who, like, were against the whole Catholicism thing about the ornate. They just didn't like the Catholic Church. The Protestant thing is a whole other thing. So mm. they basically were going to... Yeah. Block- yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a Luther. whole other story. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> and side note, I found this out, and I guess I should have known it, but it didn't ever occur to me. The Catholic Church actually considered being Protestant heresy which I never thought about. 
but it kind of makes sense. Anyway, You're calling me a heretic? No, I'm just saying at the time, I'm sure they've like. <laughs> I probably am. I'm you sure know, there's it's kind of metal about Protestant or whatever that it literally has the word protest in it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyways, off topic as uh, usual. <laughs> on topic. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you the death metal Christ music. <laughs> <laughs> Praise be God. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go to that church. You're right. Heavy metal church, million dollar idea. Dude, I bet you it's out there. I'm oh my God. I bet you it's there. Like, if there's if a heavy I had metal the... church, I'll go. Okay, so the Calvinists are <laughs> like, boo the Catholic church. You guys have too much like ornate stuff. And they had other things that they didn't like. But anyway, so they they were in Ghent for whatever reason. And they were like... We're going to bust in the church and we're going to like pull that thing down from the altar and we're going to like burn in the streets because that's going to be like completely brutal. And we're all about that. So they go to the the cathedral where the altarpiece is and they're trying to get in. But the cathedral had heard about it and they barricaded the doors and posted guards. They were like, no, you're not getting in here. And the Calvinists eventually gave up that first night because they weren't able to get in. But then the cathedral people were like whoa, that was like a lot of people. If they come back, they're probably going to overwhelm us and we're not going to be able to actually protect the painting. So during the, the day, I guess, they didn't really say. So they dismantled the paint the painting because it's in panels. So they took it apart and they hid it. And the next night, the Calvinist came back with a motherfucking battering ram. And yeah. Busted into the church. But when they got in there, the painting was gone. So they, I think they broke some other stuff and stuff like that. But... <laughs> I just have this mental image of a Calvinist coming in with the battering ram being like, yeah, look around and like, oh, and then there's that little like place with the dish with the holy water and them just kind of like knocking it over like a cat being like, fuck you and leaving. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it stayed hidden. It stayed hidden until 1584. The siege of Ghent happened. There was like a duke or something and he like chased them out of town. I was like, don't come back. Everybody was like, yay, Catholicism. And they were able to put the altarpiece back in 1584. So what was that? That was from 1566 to 1584. That thing was hidden away. Wow. Wow. Everything was cool again until 1781. So in 1781, there was a guy. He was an emperor, Emperor Joseph. And he didn't like the Catholic decadence of the church. He thought it that the Catholic church had started to worship icons instead of like using them as like, a, I mean, kind of, I mean, that we've talked about that before, how the Catholic church is kind of like borders on like witchcraft sometimes with stuff that they did and whatever, but Yo. <laughs> whatever. So that's a whole nother, another story. Yeah, that's, <laughs> <a whole other> thing. <laughs> that's for the religion podcast. <laughs> right. He actually also was like, yo, that's porn because the, paintings of adam and eve they were painted nude but unlike other naked at that time they weren't like idealized or anything like that he painted them realistically they looked too real to this dude and he was like that's like pornographic and we don't he had the panels of adam and eve actually removed from the painting and he replaced them with like censored versions and they were like painted to have like bare skin clothing on them. <laughs> I'm just imagining like the, the a black bar that says censored. And then it was like cool for like 13 years. And then the French Revolution happened. No one ever suspects the French Revolution. The I French Revolution it. happened. I'm just, I'm try- See, I tried Some to people off. lost their heads. Yeah, stuff uh. like that. But, you know, rocks fall, everyone dies, it's fine. Mm-hmm. In 1789... They ate a bunch of cake. They, no, there was no. no cake. There was no cake. The cake was that alive. Was the cake. <laughs> <laughs> so Deadly so, neurotoxins. <laughs> 1789, the monarchy was gone, and there was a new emphasis on human rights and democracy, and there was a whole movement of, like, Robin Hood stuff where they would like take from the rich and like display for the common man. So it was like a symbol of like the end of that art only being like housed in like the residences of like the elite. And they would like, they moved a bunch of them uh, to a museum in Paris. Uh, So in 1793, the Louvre opened to hold all of this like stolen art. And it was actually formerly the royal palace so that's badass like they took the palace and they were like this is like now the museum for the people and 
and put it all in there. That's um, fascinating. But here's the joke. But, but there's a but because I have a but. But 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 but. but. The Louvre was only open three days for the common person. Seven oh. days a week, the Louvre was only open to scholars and artists. So even oh, though right. they said that it was for the common man, what they really meant was it's for the culturally superior instead of the wealth superior. So there was like a switch in like power for that, oh. which I thought was was um, crazy. I mean, it's all, it's, it's all shitty. I mean, everybody should be able to see it. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Art was kind of like seen as more of a trophy than like for it like appreciated for its beauty, which was like a shift in like the way people thought about art. Mm -hmm. Trophies, trophy wives, trophy yeah. husbands. So in 1794. Heads in a basket, trophy, French Revolution. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Basically, like, <laughs> French Revolution stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> Okay, so in 1794, the central panels fell into the hands of the Republican army, and the other panels were, like, in storage at that time, so they didn't. Throughout its history, like, the altarpiece has been, like, separated. Like, there's pieces here and there, and it's, like, really hard to keep track of where it was. Well, so was something that freaking big that has a bunch of different panels? Like, well, I mean, ideally, it would just stay all in one place, right? Yeah. <laughs> ideally. So the central panels are, like, now on display in Paris. The side panels are, like, in storage. And then in 1795, the reign of terror comes to an end. That's, like, stop killing people or whatever. And so in 1796, Napoleon starts coming into power, kind of. I think he was, like, a general or something. And he sanctions the looting of art in people's homes and stuff because soldiers aren't getting paid. And he's like, I don't want you guys abandoning the army, so it's cool if you steal stuff or whatever. But then people just start stealing stuff instead of actually fighting. Oh my god. <laughs> and so he's like, okay, I know what I said, but like now you guys can't loot because you suck. And so <laughs> he had With to that. like walk back on it. I just don't see what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine like being like, hey, you know, Jacques, where were you? And he was like, I've been here the whole time. He's got like a Rembrandt under his arm or something. <laughs> got, a, got a stack of paintings. Like, what you got there? A smoothie. So, the, yeah, they were just showing up like after the fighting was over. And it's like, yeah. Why, did you want a croissant? I'm sorry. It's just a painting of a croissant. <laughs> do, are, are you hungry? Do you want this one? Or do you want, there, there's, there's one of a naked lady. I know how you like naked ladies. Would you like the naked lady? You know what's funny to me is that if some if some soldier broke into my house and started stealing all these paintings that I painted, I'd be like, "Well, jokes on you because I made the paint with my pee." So enjoy. <laughs> this painting smells funny. Mm -hmm. Enjoy. Enjoy that field of yellow wildflowers. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> So then in 1802, the dude who was running the museum in Paris, the Louvre, he was like, ah, oh, it's like such a bummer that I don't have like the wing panels. Like I've got the main piece, but I want the wing panels. And he was like, I really wish we'd gotten them when we looted this stuff from the cathedral in the first place. So <laughs> by, that, by that time, like the relationship between Ghent and, and the army was good. So he couldn't just go back and rob them. So he offered to like buy them, but they were like, no, nah, we're good. And he was like, well, what if I trade you for, like, these other paintings, like Rubens or something? And they're like, no, we really want to keep our historical heritage here. Thanks. And so he just couldn't take it. So that kind of fell through. And then in 1814, Napoleon falls from power. He's exiled to that island. The art was returned to their native towns, but not necessarily to, like, their churches and places that they had actually come from just the towns just like towns and they were like put into museums and stuff mm. half of the stuff was uh returned and half of it was kept in louvre and they they put a guy back on the throne like the disposed king or whatever they were like hey you're cool you can rule again but not really like we're still in power but you can like eat and like play like you're the king or whatever then Napoleon comes back. I don't know. Like, I didn't even know this, that he like escaped from the island and he's like, I'm going to come back and like take power again. So the king that they had put in power ran away and he actually ran away to Ghent where they like hit him. And once Napoleon was defeated. I love your again, face, Wade. Well, no, I'm just like, you're going to run from Napoleon. That guy's like four feet tall. Like <laughs> He's actually like five, six or five, seven. Well, whatever. I mean, I <laughs> You're going to run from a guy who had to escape an island to get, I don't know. 
I mean, I, I'm sure I, he was alone. He had like, like an by army. the time that like Napoleon got out of the island, he's probably all rough and gruff and stuff, and got a big beard, and he's just like, "I'm here to fuck shit up <laughs> <laughs> for the French." Uh huh. Fuck you. That's your French impression. <laughs> no, I'm not even gonna try. I'm just not. <laughs> you can laugh at me all you want. No, I was beautiful. I loved it. Yes, I am beautiful. Thank you. So the king is like, thanks for hiding my ass and saving my ass, Gint. As a reward for that, he returns the center panel to the town of Gint to the cathedral. And so the pa- like the painting is whole again. Like they have all the bits to it. <gasps> Yay! So happy- Reunited and it feels so good. <laughs> whole year. Oh. oh. And then they got a divorce. No. Oh. So oh. in a, a whole year... One whole year later. So, like, in 1816, the bishop is, like, out of town. And so the Monsignor of the Cathedral is an accomplice in in stealing <sighs> some of the side panels. And inside they, job. Yeah, it was an inside job. And they think there's, like, suspicion that the bishop knew about it. It's this whole conspiracy of, like, what happened. But they took him during the night, and they sold him to, like, a known... Like, he already had a buyer for him. So it was like, it wasn't even Damn. like, yeah, it wasn't even like he did it and he was like hoping to sell him. It was like more like this dude like paid this guy to like steal him for him. They sold for $36,000 one panel and another one sold for about $120,000, like relevant to like today's money. Oh, wow. Uh, but the Adam and Eve panels were like left behind for some reason, but some of the other panels were stolen. And in 1821, those were sold to the king of prussia to establish a museum that was supposed to outdo the louvre they sold in two sales one was for uh, the equivalent of 55 million dollars today and the other one sold for 10 million dollars today so so some of the side panels were like over there and the main stuff still in the cathedral so in 1822 there's a fire in the cathedral (gasps) yeah oh no so they were able to get it out but it did suffer smoke damage. When they were cleaning off the smoke damage, that's when actually when they discovered the inscription that attributes it to Hubert, the brother, which may or may not be legitimate. That's mm. what they found. Okay, so in 1830, the wings are sold or moved to a museum in Berlin, and Van Eyck is becoming like one of the most desired artists among this time. Like the author of the book that I was reading called it Van Eyck Mania, kind of like Beatle Mania. Like everybody was like scrambling to have one of his paintings. It was moved to a museum in Berlin, and they what they actually did is they split the panels. So basically, it tore in half. Like no. yeah, so that you could see both sides. Because remember, it was like on the door, so it was painted like on both sides. So they split it so you could see both sides looking straight on. I love your look of disapproval, Jade. I'm so mad. And they said it was controversial even back then. And just now, just knowing who painted it, I'm just like, how could they? I know. Yeah. That's why I'm just sitting here like, the fuck are you doing? Like, why would you do this to this beautiful piece of artwork? Like, uh, that hurts me a- <laughs> on a cellular level. That yeah. hurts me. I need a TARDIS so I can go back in time and slap this motherfucker. Right. I'm like, who did that? Like, who actually like was like, hey, this is a good idea. Like, I want to know the dude. They they didn't attribute it. Maybe nobody knows. 1861, the Belgian government they oversaw the sale of Adam and Eve panels uh, to the National Gall- Gallery in Brussels. Oh no, no, they didn't sell them. They moved them to the National Gallery in Brussels for display and safekeeping. And then 1864 to the First World War. That's kind of how things stayed. And then the First World War... Trench warfare happened. That's true. Mustard gas. Um, bayonets. No serrated bay- bayonets. That's, that's that's a no-no. So in the First World War, it was like the first time people were like, hey, you know what? Art's kind of important. Let's not go in there and steal everything because that's just not cool. And it was the first time it was seen as like a cultural importance and not something that you could just steal. Thanks so God. everybody kind of agreed that like, they were going to try to preserve works of art and national monu- monuments where they could and not disturb it. At least that's what everybody like said on paper was that every everything was going to be cool as far as like art went. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they lied. Fingers crossed behind their back. Be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not going to steal stuff. As soon as they leave, take that shit. I'm going to take that pee painting. 
<laughs> this painting of these yellow wildflowers, I just have to have. <laughs> I feel like yellow wildflowers is a good name for this episode. <laughs> or maybe heavy metal church. So Germany had the wings of the panel in Berlin in that museum. So yeah. they kind of want to like complete the set. And then I think the people in the cathedral kind of knew that everything that people were saying was bullshit. And they were just like, yeah, they say they're not going to steal anything, but I know they're going to come for the, this because they want it. So they, like, get some. they, they were making plans to like hide it. But by the time that they had thought about like moving it, and maybe possibly like even shipping it abroad to protect it from the Germans. The Germans were already like right on their ass. So they couldn't actually like move it abroad. So what they did was they smuggled it out during the middle of the night. And how they did it was they actually bought a junk cart, which was described as like a merchant who would like sell like bits and bobs, rugs and brooms and just like different things that you would need for your household would come through town with all this crap in the back of a cart pulled by a horse Nice. And people were like super used to seeing it. It was like a thrift store on wheels or something. Ooh, and, yeah. And so they, the people in the cathedral bought one of those carts off of somebody. They took everything out of it, put the panels in it, like, of course, in crates and stuff to protect it, then put all the junk back on top of it. And then they like secretly, like in the middle of the night, as that, that was their cover, they moved it to two different houses and hid it in these two houses there. Only a couple of people actually knew where it was. And they also falsified records. They got like a some kind of an order or something. And they had like the governor or the magistrate sign it saying that they had ordered the panels to be shipped out of the country to England. And Ooh. they backdated it so that it looked like they'd been gone like from a long time ago. So the Germans came into town. They're like, yo, we know you have it. Like, where is it? Just tell us where you're hiding it. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, nobody knows where it's at. It's in England. And they were just like, bullshit. You didn't send it to England. Those fuckers keep everything. Why would you send them art? They're just going to keep it. Mm. And they were like, no, for real. Like, we don't have it. Oh, my God. And so, I don't like, know what you're talking about. <laughs> so they what kept, are you saying about? <laughs> so they kept, like, asking, like, where it was. And, of course, they they kept to their story. And then it started happening where people's houses in the region were being like commandeered to house soldiers, like German soldiers. And so they started mm. getting like nervous that they were going to find the paintings in uh, one of the houses. I think there was like getting close to being one of the houses that was being commandeered. And they, <laughs> the Germans kept saying like, you guys, <laughs> we just want to protect it. Like, just tell us how can we protect it if you don't tell us where it is. So Ugh. they were they were playing like good cop with them. It was ridiculous. And they were like, a cookie. Right. <laughs> they were like, no, really, we don't know where it's at. I'm sorry. So then once the they started getting to closer to the houses where they're actually kept, they moved it again in the middle of the night to the bishop's residence. And then again I have after- feelings about that. Because if they're already eyeballing the church about stuff, and then they're just like, okay, we gotta move this again, and they move it to the bishop's house. Like, with the army already, like, eyeballing them and stuff, I'd just be like, like, yeah, that's kind of a smart move, but at the same time, like... I think I think by that point, they'd already searched the bishop's house, so... Okay. Yeah, so, like, this is, like, a few years later, because it... Yeah, in 1913, they moved to the bishop's house, and then in 1918, they moved it to a church, and they actually, like, hid it behind the confessional booth. Like, they pulled the confessional booth out of the wall and, like, hid it behind the confessional booth. Wow. And it, it stayed there until the end of the war. Wow. Yeah. And then nine days after the armistice, they, like, brought that shit back out and, like, put it back where it belonged. And they were like, woohoo, party! Like, Dude, that's, like, the ultimate fuck you to the Nazis, too. Just like, haha, we had it the whole time, fuck you! No, 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 this is just World War One. This, oh. is just, this is just World War One, yeah. So then, oh no, no, you think that's a fuck you to the, the Germans? Let me tell you what the real fuck you to the Germans was. So after the Germans lost, mm-hmm. the people were like, yo, you got to pay reparations. <laughs> and one of the things you're going to do is you're going to give back some shit. And not just the shit you took, other shit. So they made them return the wings that had been housed in that museum in Berlin two Ooh. kids and they were like we're taking these back they belong to us they're coming back and that really super duper pissed the germans off like super duper because they uh, to them to them they had legitimately bought them after mm-hmm. that theft from that one like art dealer dude so they were like no no, no these are ours like we paid money for them and they're like well yeah but you know you stole them and even if you didn't fuck you because you lost the war and we're taking them back 
Yeah. Epic. Sucks to be a loser. <laughs> right? Sucks to suck. So then, in between World War One and World War Two, something crazy happened. How is the what aliens could possibly happen to this poor piece of art? Good God! So in 1934, somebody in the middle of the night sneaks in and steals a single panel. It's called the Righteous Judges. It's the bottom left-hand panel. It's like dudes riding in horses towards the Lamb of God. Just that one panel. They took it out and they left a note, and it just said, "Taken." F- from germany by the treaty of versailles that was what like the note said and it was like supposedly everybody thought it was in like retaliation for the wings having been taken back from germany because the name of the document that made them give it all back was the treaty of versailles Mm. so there's like all these conspiracy theories about it some people say there was like a massive cover-up some people say that the church was involved somehow and there's like theories about how it was i don't know I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. After it was stolen, a ransom note is sent. And this dude's like, yo, I need 1 million Belgian francs. And I need a promise that you're not going to like pursue any kind of legal action. And if you accept that, then I'll give you back the painting, the panel. He's like, put an ad in the paper in the classifieds with a specific note saying if you like agree or not. This ransom note is sent to the bishop. Well, the bishop goes to the police with it. And he's like, hey, this is what's going on. And the, and everybody's like, well, no, we're not going to pay a million. That's ridiculous. And so they write a reply in the in the newspaper. And they're just like, no, we're not sending that. You're not my type. Right. You're not my type. Whatever. <laughs> and so they were like, you know, that price is way too high. And the, the guy sent another note. And he's like, look, if you don't pay me, I'm going to start sending pieces of this artwork back to you. Now, oh. remember... This is a two-sided panel. So the the Righteous Judge is one side. That's the more famous one. And that's the more valuable one. Because that's actually one of the panels that, that they suspect that the painter actually put a self-portrait in. And the other side, I think, is like, oh. it's either one of the statues or one of the patrons that actually paid for, for the uh, painting. But the the ones with the horses, that those are the ones that, that everybody's like super concerned about. Oh, no. So, so they were like, <laughs> and they were like, no, nah, we're good. And then the, the thief was like, look, Bishop. I understand this is like a hassle for you. So tell you what I'm going to do. If you pay me my million francs, you can go ahead and keep 5% of it as commission for like, <laughs> for like what? during the deal. Yeah. That's what the thief says. I get to keep 5% of my own money buying back something you stole from me. Right. Well, I think it was technically going to be like the church's money or, or the, the Belgium's money. So mm-hmm. they agreed to like, a, a kind of a trade of like a first trade to patch up the deal for I think they were trying to con- negotiate like a lesser amount so what mm-hmm. happens is a, a letter arrives with a ticket like a voucher to a locker in a train station they're like go there and you're gonna see like a, a token of our good faith and so they go there they open the locker and it's got it's got the one panel the one that they said they were gonna slice up and send them in bits if they didn't <sighs> get that panel in it so it's the statue of St. John. So but not the other side. No, the other side, the guy still has it. The really Ooh. valuable one. They're like, so like, they're like, then they write again. They're like, look, we're good guys. See, we, we gave you the, the first half of the panel in good faith. And so now I hope you're going to keep your end of the bargain. And they came up with this like crazy way of like, there's going to be this monk in this abbey. And, and the reason, the way that you're going to know it's the guy that we send is because we're going to tear up a piece of like a newspaper and he's going to have one half and we'll send you the other half. And it was like all these like instructions, like these crazy things to do. Oh my God. But by this time, the notes were going to the bishop. The bishop was like, yo, I don't want none of this. And he was like handing him straight over to the police. So the police was actually handling this part of nice. the negotiations. The bishop wasn't handling it at all. And the police were like, no, we're not paying the money. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. They didn't really have any leads. Somebody had seen somebody like throw that painting in the locker, but he was like nondescript and nobody like could say who it was. So um, that's depressing. The guy sends a total of like 13 notes. And by the end, the relationship between him and the police have broken down so, so much. He's like, I can't trust you. You guys suck. Never I'm mind. Up. I'm He's like, I'm the only person who knows where this painting is. You guys are never going to see it. History is going to hate you. You guys totally, totally, totally suck. And the police are like, Psh, whatever. Who cares about art? I don't care. Like, whatever. And we're not going <laughs> to negotiate with you. So whatever. And so they ended up closing the case in 1934. Oh, no, sorry. They closed the case in 1937. 
Okay, I was just like, they close it the same year. I'm just no, like, it's, they're it's so fucking done in a couple of months. Like, you have to be a real fucking tool to make, like, a law enforcement agency just be like, yeah, no, fuck you. Right. So they close the case in 1937, and they're just like, whatever the fuck. Then Hitler happens. Not quite. No, I'm not done with this story because the story gets fucked. So this are, you, guy, are you still in 1937? I'm in 1937, as far as I know. I don't see another thing in my notes. So this guy's like at a meeting with this Catholic, I don't know, group. And he like collapses from like a heart attack. And he like, they carry him back to his house. And he's like, they're like, hey, you want us to go like go get the priest? And he's like, no, 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 get my lawyer. And they're like, why? And he's like, get my lawyer. I need to talk to my lawyer. They go and get his lawyer. His lawyer goes in there. They shut the door. They're in there alone for like, 15 minutes the lawyer comes back out the guy's died this guy that collapsed the heart attack he's died shit but he told his lawyer with his dying breath that he was the one that stole it he knows where it's at he tells the guy to go find a key and look in his study and there's like a file in there that has copies of all these like letters it has an unsent letter like with all this other stuff all these other thoughts like that he was gonna send i think they end up taking all of his books or something like that from his study after all that then the lawyers go to the police and are like hey this is what they told that we said so like there's all these conspiracy theories about like who actually stole it some people think it's like an investment group who was like trying to steal it to like get money to like pay back their debts some people think it was the church whatever like nobody knows who actually did it some people Hmm. think it was Nazis because some people think there is actually like a treasure map to some Catholic relics that's hidden in that panel. And they were trying to keep what? it. Yeah. That like, does sound like some Nazi bullshit because Nazis were all into that, like treasure hunting, occult, witchy. Yeah. Say, like, the Nazis, they, beyond the obvious fucked up shit that the Nazis did, I mean, they were into some shit. Yeah, like, they were into some shit. So oh I wouldn't put it past them at all. Yeah, I guess. It was, supposedly it was supposed to have a map that was supposed to lead to like the Spear of Destiny and a bunch of other like things that had to do with like Jesus. And some people say that a secret society stole it to keep it out of the Nazi hands. Like it's just a mess. It's a mess. So spoiler alert: that panel has never been found. <gasps> like, they have they have like clues. There's clues that it's like hidden in plain sight and that like it's some people like theorize that it's never left the site of the cathedral. There was like an investigation at some point where they actually went and they x-rayed parts of the cathedral, but they ran out of money before they could go through all of it. Oh. And there's also a theory that so like uh, in 1939, a dude like made a replica of the panel to, to be able to put it back in the painting. And there's some people that say that the actual original is underneath the replicate panel. I don't know. Okay. okay. So that's like a big mystery for this thing. But to anybody's knowledge, it's never been found. It's still missing. And at this point, it might be destroyed. Like they just consider it lost because it may pop up somewhere. I don't know. Wow. wow. That's uh, yeah. In 1938, they get one more clue. Some dude walks up. So I think a police station or the bishop or something. And they're like, hey, give me 500,000 francs and I'll tell you where the painting is. <gasps> yeah. But the police are like, this is like almost a direct quote. They say, no, we don't negotiate with gangsters. This isn't America. <laughs> oh. I was about to say, that's like, they basically said, I'm like the president. I don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> right? Damn. So 1938, they refuse that offer, and then one year later, suspiciously, 1939, they put that copy in, which is why some people think the original's under there, and that that guy was actually had something to do with it, and mm. that it's it's actually under there. So, yeah, they've been looking for it this whole time. As recently as in 2008, there was like a tip that it was underneath a floorboard in some house somewhere, and they like ripped up the floorboards. They they're still looking for it. It's crazy. It's like one of those crazy mysteries that some people are still trying to solve. Oh man. Wow. Oh gosh. Yeah. Okay, now we're on to World War II. Oh my gosh, there's still more. I know. I'm telling you, this is crazy. This is what it took me all day. <laughs> this is intense. Man. It's so crazy. I'm totally digging it though. This is like ah uh, ah. Uh, just... Okay. <laughs> Are you ready for more? Are you ready? Are you prepared? Yeah. So in World War II, Nazis, they're coming. So they were like 
we got to hide this thing. So the Vatican offers to take it in for protection. And so they yeah, because it. Italy's not in cahoots with Germany. I mean, yeah, but the Vatican is like its own thing. Yeah, right? it is. Their so guards have the weirdest outfits. They're so cool. I think they still hand make them. <gasps> they hand make them? Okay. I like them a little bit more. I'm pretty sure. I saw like a documentary randomly about the guy who's like been the tailor for the Vatican for like 50 years or something like that. I don't know. Really? I want to see those guards getting in a fight, like like death match style fight those Vatican guard dudes just like wailing on somebody. They're I think probably that would be highly trained. I mean, I yeah. feel like, I feel like they're actually probably scarier than we even think. Cause the Catholic, they got like crazy. psychic powers and shooting fireballs out of their forehead. And like, pew, 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 pew. I don't know about all that. The power of the Holy spirit. Uh, Savannah, I almost oh. called you Jade or, or Jessica or something else. I don't, mm, my medication's okay. wearing off. Oh no. Okay. I'll try to hurry. It's okay. Like take your time. That just means that my wild ride is going to be even more of a wild ride. Okay. Awesome. Russell unleashed. <laughs> <laughs> So the plan Why are you is- running through the street naked. Ah! <laughs> the plan is to move it to the Vatican. They load it up in a truck and they're taken into the Vatican, but <laughs> they're on the way to the Vatican. They're so close. <laughs> they're on the way to the Vatican and then war breaks out. So they have to like detour. They don't make it to the Vatican. Fuck. They the truck. France is like, yo, we'll take it. It'll be fine <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, it'll be totally fine in France. They house it in a museum. And as France is invaded, it's eventually found and it's taken to Paris. And then in 1944, there is a movement to try to like preserve some of the art. And there's actually like people in that are trying to be like, they're like professors and architects and just artists and people in general who are like, hey, we, we need to like make sure this is going to be safe as the, as the Nazis pull out because the war was coming to an end. Mm-hmm. And there was actually a movie based on it. Do you remember in 2014 there's a movie called Monuments Men? Had yes, like- I actually was gonna, this whole thing has made me think about that movie. <laughs> this, whole, this whole episode. Yeah, I so, so I started watching it for this, but I didn't finish it. The movie opens with like shots of this piece. <gasps> so if you go back and watch it, like the first thing you see is like the top panels and like close ups of, of the lamb and stuff like that. So yeah, in 2014, mm-hmm. there's a movie. It's like produced by George Clooney, starring George Clooney. It's got uh, like John Goodman and like all these other people in it. It's actually really good, but I only got to watch half of it before this. Wow. So they're like established. And there's also like, this girl her, who is a total badass her name is rose she was like a secretary in paris for the germans but she spoke fr- or she spoke german but they didn't know it they thought she only spoke french so she, the whole time she's sitting there working for them yeah like fine on them uh, sneaky bitch yeah keeping catalogs of like where stuff is and stuff like that Fuck um, yeah. stuff happens it's discovered that the art is in a salt mine that's like where it's being stored Cra- crazy shit happens crazy shit happens really blow my mind like it hasn't <laughs> been blown to, twice like, order. or three times <laughs> so basically first it's moved to the castle that was the inspiration for walt disney's castle in disneyland like it's moved oh. to that castle then it's okay. moved to the salt mines and there's like this thing it's called the nero edict or something like that that, that hitler puts in place and basically what he says is like hey we don't want to leave anything behind. We know we're about to lose. So like burn it to the ground. They're just like <gasps> everything. Like don't let anybody get your hands on anything. But then, cause you know, Hitler loved art. He was like a failed artist. And that was one of like, one of the reasons what his obsession for like art, he like went back on that a little bit. And it was like, no, 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 let's, let's try to preserve the art at all costs because I love art, heart art. But his general that was like in charge of the salt mine where everything was, was like, whatever i'm gonna blow it up because fuck these people i don't like them i'm gonna do what i want and by this time the communications were like breaking down between like the germans and all of the the what do they call them the axis of power i don't know the yeah Europe. axis yeah <laughs> and axis uh, an not only that but hitler had like already committed suicide like he he was like dead so like this guy was gonna do whatever he wanted and he like made plans to blow up the salt mines well the salt miners, the guys who's, who were actually like mining the salt there, mm-hmm. accidentally found the bombs in crates and they were oh. like, fuck this shit. They moved the bombs out to the forest and they did everything in their power to like 
tell people what was going on. They also Go miners. Like, yeah, so they took it upon themselves to also set charges at the mouth of the mine and like blow it up so that it collapsed and that people couldn't go into there. So the guy who was going to blow everything up had to abandon his plan of like blowing everything up. Good. So there's a scene in the Monument Men where one of them goes to the dentist and uh, has like a rotten tooth and the guy pulls it out and he's like, yo, do you want to meet my son-in-law? He was uh, a Nazi soldier and he likes art and like his job was like doing art stuff like the way you're doing art stuff except, you know, Germans would steal it and they're like, yeah, sure, we'll meet him. And he was the one that actually clued them in into the salt mine. So while the miners were doing their own thing, like trying to protect the art, the monument men were getting tipped uh, off on where this stuff was. And there was like a bunch of people trying to make it to the salt mines before like people were blowing stuff up. up. And it was just like, it was just crazy. So when they finally like get into the salt mine and they like move all the rubble out of the way so they can actually get in, they Mm -hmm. find the altarpiece like laying on the ground like somebody had like taken it out of storage to like have like I guess one last look at it before they like abandoned like the ship and like left. Oh my gosh. They said that it had like bandages on it where it had been damaged oh. and where like the paint had like blistered because of all like the change of hum- humidity and stuff. Oh my god. Yeah, so not oh my god. not in like a good good shape. Because of how famous the artwork was, it was one of like the first two pieces of art that was returned. And it was actually paid for by the US to like get these pieces of art back where they needed to be. Aww. <laughs> they load this thing up on a plane. There's only like the pilot and one passenger and the piece of artwork. Like nobody else is on it. They're, the plan is to like land in Brussels and then go to Ghent with it. But this is the Ghent altarpiece. So of course it can't go that smoothly. They're flying in the air. There's a big ass storm. They can't land in Brussels. They have to land like an hour away. It's two in the morning. Nobody is at the airport. And so the guy is like, operator, give me like, I need to talk to somebody like in charge, but they can't get a hold of them. So oh. he has the operator call around to every soldier that's stationed there that he knows of until he can find somebody. The guy is like, he like commandeers like jeeps, runs around to all these bars, picks up all these soldiers, and was like, "We need to move this art." And so they take the art in the middle of the night, like on these cars these guys have basically stolen, and they they drive it all the way to the bishop's palace. Oh, <laughs> and that's how it finally like makes its way back to Ghent. Oh my god! Yeah, wow. and the guy was like, when he get he got there at like three in the morning, he was like, "I need something saying that we delivered it." <laughs> Like he asked for a receipt because he was so freaked out by the whole thing. And then they were like, yeah, man, here's your receipt. Thanks so much. We're going to set you up in like the royal quarters that we only like let like royalty sleep in. And he was like, cool. And he like crashed. So like they brought it back to Ghent. There was like parades and speeches and it was like displayed for like one month. And then finally it was moved back to the chapel in its original home. That's the story of the altarpiece of Ghent and its crazy journey. And I don't even think I talked about all the crimes because it said there was 13. So it includes oh like, like uh, forgery, theft, like Gosh. all kinds of crazy stuff. I will say like from like more recent history, not as far as like crime or anything, the uh, it, it started go- undergoing um, a restoration in 2010 and it's actually ongoing. Like, yeah, from 2010 Whoa. up until now, they're restoring it. They've done like certain sections or whatever. And I think they said that the painting that's in the chapel right now is, I mean, sorry, the cathedral right now is actually a replica while they like clean everything up. I did find something neat. There is a site that you can go to. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's run by the Getty Foundation and uh, it's called Closer to Van Eyck. And you can go on there and you can see where they've done like high resolution photographs, scans, x-rays, all that stuff is online for you to like go and look. And you can like zoom in really far to like see all the detail on this thing. And it's free to like go and like check that out. That's um, cool. So yeah, if you get a chance, Damn. I'll put that on the Instagram, all the links to the stuff I found. I think they're the ones that are actually financing or handling the restoration right now. Ta-da. So wow. I just want to- Damn. <laughs> My Damn. Son- my sources were the Getty Foundation, Wikipedia, and a book called The Stealing of the Mystic Lamb by no- Noah Callan. But that is the crazy, crazy, crazy history of the altarpiece of Ghent. And I had no Shit. idea how crazy it was when I started researching it. But 
so fucking crazy. Damn. Damn. Oh my gosh. That was a ride, man. Like you could do a movie just about that painting and have the painting be the main character. I know. Why has this not been done? I would watch that movie. I would watch that movie. Like, I mean, damn. art or not, like, that's such an interesting story. Like, just yes. all the shit that that poor piece of artwork went through. Like, it makes me wonder, like, about what some of the other famous pieces of art have been through, like, over the years. Like, I know, yes. I'm sure that, I'm sure with, like, all the wars and stuff that have happened, you know, over, you know, it, throughout history, I mean, I'm sure that there are other very famous, you know, that there are other art pieces that have been through just as much. Mm. Like, I mean, good God. Ugh. Well, I, I guess I picked a doozy because there's been more than one source that has said this has been, like, the most coveted piece of art in, in the history of forever. Damn. Savannah coming out with a heavy hitter. Shit. I did not mean to. It just sounded neat. <laughs> that's it and i think i think the reason i wanted to do it is because i was like oh i watched that movie that's cool but like i had no idea yeah so it's like one of my new favorite pieces of art <laughs> i'm definitely gonna keep looking into it because i i with as much as happened i almost feel like i didn't have enough time to research the whole thing and <laughs> i don't even think the book that i read put everything in there honestly oh. so Wait damn there. all right russell you gotta top that <laughs> <laughs> So shit. shit. First, I need to take a potty break. I actually do too. So this and, is- and get a snack. Like I need some. Yeah, I'm gonna here. go get dinner real quick. Okay, cool. We'll meet back here in a second. I like how I had to have a fucking intermission. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are we ready to get back into it? Yep. So I did. I think that this is also a wild ride. It might not be as intense as Savannah's because Savannah's takes place over centuries, whereas mine just doesn't. (laughs) So I'm doing the best art thief of all time. Okay, this is exciting. Stefan Brettweiser. Okay, I don't know anything about him, but I'm super excited to hear about like an art thief. Like a career art thief. Like I'm always like I'm fascinated by art theft and art crimes. So this sounds amazing. Like it is in it, it, it's absolutely insane about this dude because like uh okay, we're gonna get into it because I was about to be like, and this and that and that. And I was like, no, we gotta we gotta start at the beginning before we can get to some of the crazy. So he's born in 1971 in uh the northern parts of France, and his mother's a nurse and his dad is a like in sales or office work or something they're a pretty well off family and his dad's got a lot of pre-revolutionary war art from like the 16 17 1800s and everything so like in a lot of like military art too so he's got like guns weapons bayonets nice furniture really nice cabinetry like all of this really nice art shit so as homeboys growing up, his family's just like, all right, cool. You're also going to be well off too. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to have like a nice paying job, all of this stuff. And he doesn't do that. He drops out of college. Why do I feel like any story that starts off with like his parents wanted him to be a lawyer, that person always like ends up not being a lawyer. I feel like I've heard that For so real. Many times. For real. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a doctor too. Like, lawyer or doctor like they'll start going to school for it and they just drop out (laughs) yeah so like and at one point he works at a museum as a security guard for a month for a month this is very relevant relevant to the story shortly after he does that like it's in his early 20s and about the time that he's 22 his parents go through like a nuclear divorce shit hits the fan it's very messy very loud and his dad takes everything all of the like the nice stuff the military art all of the furniture and his mom him and his mom have to move into a small apartment during that time he meets this girl and Catherine something her last name's french i'm not even going to try to pronounce it so (laughs) stefan and Anne start a relationship eventually his mom moves into another house and they so they go from like antique rich life to ikea furniture like real fast so there's some kind of controversy on where it starts for stefan by the way stefan's an only child too 
like whenever his mom gets the house, he lives in, in an apartment attic kind of thing in the house. And it's right next to a river or canal that Napoleon had set up in France. So that way there could be more waterways and trades and everything. So there's this canal. I forget what it's called. I could probably look it up, but I'm not <laughs> like near the house. So like they're doing a lot better. He's got a girlfriend. The girlfriend moves in and she's also like archaeology student. And so they, they have this shared bond over old art. At one point they're at a, I think a private exhibition of some old classical kind of art the stuff that he really really digs and he sees this gun that he's just like oh, i really want this and i like it and his girlfriend goes take it so he does he just takes the old <laughs> antique gun and puts it in his pants wow. and they walk out with it and wow it was yeah. that easy yeah oh my god it's Why like, wasn't I stealing artwork if it's that easy? <laughs> oh my god, just you wait. Just you like, oh. So ah. it's like the 70s though, right? So it's probably just sitting on a table. It's not the 70s. This is 1995. What the hell? So either that was the first theft or this one was in March of 1995 in Switzerland. Guyers, Switzerland. I think that's how how you do it. Uh, Stefan finds this painting that he just loves of this like older lady or of this like lady. And he's just enraptured by it. He's just like, it's calling to me. It's calling my heart. And at one point he's quoted as saying it was the beauty of the painting captivated me and the eyes of the woman reminded me of my grandmother. So I had to take it. Wow. That's kind of sweet. Yeah. Like, if it's true. It is sweet and it's pretty cool. It's just like, oh, that's that's so neat. So there's some controversy on which one it was and where he was, because I've got another note that says like his first was in Bonn, Germany, and I was just like, ah, I don't know. Yeah, it was the beauty that interested me. And he uses his girlfriend to distract the guards. And while she's distracted, he cuts the painting out of the frame and has to like loosen up a few nails and takes the painting out and sticks it in his coat and they walk out. God damn. This becomes the routine for them to steal art. For the next few years, he and his girlfriend, like they, they'll be at a, at a museum or something. And he'd just be like, wow, I really love this piece. And she'd go on lookout and he'd take it. And it would be small galleries, private galleries, churches, little small places with little bits of security. Either that or they... Because he did do security work at a museum and stuff. They they find out which cameras were fake. Where the hidden places in the cameras. Like when are the guards passing by. I'm of the opinion that no camera should ever be fake. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I just Especially think. in an art museum. Especially in an art museum. But I'm talking like convenience stores. Schools. Places of business. Yeah. If you have a camera fucking make it real i don't I, I know it costs you some money but i just don't it's not i don't think it's as much of a deterrent as you think it is i just don't understand it i don't like it and like how do you feel as somebody who's working in a convenience store or something knowing that, that fucking camera's fake like the people who own the business don't even care enough about you to put a real fucking camera in there like an extra 20 bucks a month or whatever so this becomes a a routine for them. And later in the year of 1995, he gets another painting that I think is, is the one that's the most expensive painting he ever stole, which was tallied to about $8 million. Oh my God. Yeah. Like this one painting was $8 million in, in they did the same thing. Look out, make sure that nobody's there, cut it out of the frames and stuff, take real good care of it. Like he was always very careful with everything. Like there was only like one time where he had to shatter a, a, a glass casing for something. But he also like, like he liked little trinket stuff too. It was all small art. It wasn't big stuff. It was small, like one foot by one foot paintings, goblets, bugles. This dude had an issue with military bugles. <laughs> he loved them. <laughs> Goblets at one point for like a weekend, they stole five different pieces of art across Europe. They would go to one art fair and stuff. And as soon as the dealers or whatever would turn a turn around and stuff, he'd just be like, mine. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 
And then they go to another art fair. And then that's whenever they got like a silver goblet from a church and all of this other religious iconography and different things that he was just like, this is beautiful. Like we have to rescue it and take care of it. And so anything that they stole, they would take back to the house, run back upstairs because his mom's working all the time. He's still living with his mom? Oh, yeah. He's still living with his mom, hiding all of this art that he's stealing in his room, like in the closet, in his drawers, under his bed, like taking real good care of it and everything. And like all of the paintings that he steals, there's a local farmer that does woodwork and carpentry, and he takes the pieces to him to reframe them. And the the farmer is none the wiser. And he's just like, okay, yeah, sure. Because he's just a simple farmer. He doesn't really just a that. simple French farmer that doesn't, that's just like, all right, cool. Yeah, neat. Totally doing it. And so his mom doesn't know. His girlfriend's all in it. And they're loving it. Like, it's it's a milestone of their relationship. Like, they're, they're just like, yes, we're setting all of this art free. We're taking care of it. It's like rescuing puppies to them like off the side of the road and just like, look at this poor piece of art just hanging in this museum. We have to rescue it. (laughs) You're right. (laughs) Oh God. You know what I imagine? Because I'm a sick fuck. I imagine they're sick fucks and they like line up all the art on like the side of the room and they just like have like crazy sex, like with the art, like looking at it. Maybe. Like it's gotta be a fetish thing, right? Because it's like strengthening their relationship. Sorry. So yeah, and like <laughs> in the papers later and stuff, like there's stories about just like, hey, this thing got stolen. Hey, this thing got missing, and they're just like, yeah, woo, go us, look at us. They're writing about us. They don't even know it. Woo. And they're like clipping all the the articles out, and making like a scrapbook, and they're taking the scrapbook <laughs> and putting it on the floor, and then fucking on top of it. <laughs> I feel like you've thought about this, like, really thoroughly in a very short amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like, if a, if a, like, a boyfriend-girlfriend team, like, steal art and don't stop, it's got to be doing something for their love life. Like, you don't just keep doing that. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, why else? What the fuck are they doing? <laughs> I don't know. But, like, there would be times, like, uh, one of the sources said that they stole an entire hallway's worth of paintings from this one French museum because they, yeah, because they would go in and then it's like low security and stuff and just be like, I like this small thing. And he got really good at talking to people and just being like, totally just like, yeah. Cause it was at that point, he was like, this is my purpose in life. Like I found my one true love. We're doing the one true thing that I like and all is perfect and wonderful. I have so many thoughts. Share. How fucked up was he from this fucking like divorce? This guy needs therapy. (laughs) Also, this just goes to like uh, reinforce my whole thing about like I don't trust people who talk too much. You know, Uh, like to me especially, I'm just like I don't trust you. What do you want from me? That kind of a thing. I love you, Russell. You just don't I, trust me. No, I trust you now, but you know, I'm always like initially suspicious of people who are too nice to me because I'm just like, you must have some kind of ulterior motive. Like he didn't talk too much at one point, like the, the time that he shattered a glass display and stuff, he had, it was, it was like a silver goblet or trinket or something and so he put it in his pants and the security guard comes over and is just like, Hey, what are you doing? And he's just like, Oh, I'm just uh, enjoying the art museum with my girlfriend. We're about to go to the cafe. Just like simple playing, just like nothing's wrong here. I don't know what you're talking about. We're wow. going to go to the cafe. And so he'd go and sit down and enjoy his time at the cafe, have a meal with his girlfriend all the time, like trinket in his pants and just hanging out there was another time that he was he had like four or five things from a museum and he was walking out to his car and a cop was giving him a traffic ticket and while he had this stolen shit on him he talked the cop out of the traffic ticket wow (laughs) and like got in his car and was just like all right cool you have a great day bye so it, it he got very very good at it he got very great good and he got caught in 1997 in switzerland i think this is the time that it was guyer so in switzerland in 1997 he is caught stealing a landscape out of a museum and 
him and his girlfriend are taken into custody and stuff and they're questioned. He's just like, Oh, I'm so sorry. We're, we're so poor and everything. It like, she had nothing to do with it. I, I just, I wanted some beauty in my life. I promise I'll never do it again. I'm so sorry. Puppy dog eyes. And they let him go. They give him let a him go. They let him go. They give him a slap on the wrist and say, don't do it again. Don't come into Switzerland. And so he, but his job is waiting tables in Switzerland and his house is across the border in France. And so he just goes by his mother's maiden name instead and continues like stealing stuff from it, like antique shops. Like there was one time there was an antique shop and there was like this silver vase and him and his girlfriend pass by it and it's in the window and he's just like, oh my gosh, we have to rescue it. We have to save this vase. I want it. And so they walk in and he's just like, hello, is anybody here? And he hears somebody upstairs, like walking around saying, I'll be down in a minute. And so they're like, it's mine. Okay, thanks. Bye. And so they take the vase and they go back to their hotel room and they're looking it up and it's worth like a hundred, a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Like all of the art that they took back to the, to his like attic apartment, they would research everything about that piece and be like, okay, when was it made? Who made it? What all this other stuff, this becomes relevant later. Ah. And so like, they're like researching how much it's worth, like where it's been all of the history and they're just like yeah so they're looking up this vase and they're just like oh my gosh and so the girlfriend calls up that antique shop later it's just like hey so i was walking by your place a little bit ago and saw this beautiful silver vase in your window can you tell me about it it's just like yeah it's worth like a hundred thousand dollars and all this other stuff you have to come down and check it because at that time the guy had still still had not gone downstairs and looked in his front window. Like he had no idea that they had stolen it. And like they'd be at trade shows and just like jack stuff as soon as the people weren't there. There was one time he cut a painting out of a frame during an auction that was supposed to be sold. Oh like, my that God. Day. Yeah, this guy's got balls. He just like cuts it out of the frame and leaves. And there was another time that he was at, a, at an art fair. And of course, there's all this like antique shit. And he's just like, oh, this calls my name. This calls my name. I, yes. He's like, like he's grocery shopping and shit and just being like, yeah, I need a box of cereal. Just going to stuff that in my pants or in my coat. Boop, 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 boop. And at one point, he's walking down the aisle and behind him, he hears somebody yell thief. And so he turns around real quick and he's just like, are they talk? Oh, nope. They're talking about somebody else. They're chasing somebody else. I'm going to go on my merry way and continue to take shit. Oh my God. He just keeps doing it and doing it. He's stealing paintings, other exhibitionists, exhibitions, all this stuff, anything that he can put in his coat or whatever. And at one point, there is a piece that is an ivory sculpture of Adam and Eve. And it is his favorite piece. I don't remember who it was by. I didn't write that part down. Um, but like, he loves it. And it's in a private gallery at this person's house. And they have like a little set off museum where you can come and visit and everything. And so he goes and he takes this ivory scap- statue of Adam and Eve. And he's just like, yes, it's mine. It's beautiful. It's great. And is, and leaves. Like he just, this it, fucking it, guy. it's so amazing how like, easy it is for them to just be like just like like taking something off of a table and at one point there was one museum that had a display case with a little note on it that said taken taken away for uh like repairs or reconstruction or something and so he took that note went to something else that he wanted to take like gingerly like lifted the case and took the thing and placed the note there (laughs) wow And so, like, they would hit up multiple times the same museum and, like, rotate that that little plaque and take multiple things from the museum. And, like, his girlfriend would grow her hair out or cut it short or dye it. He would grow out his beard, get a haircut, so that every time they went to a different or the same museum, they would get something else and look different. And there was only one moment of video footage that France had caught of him, and it's so just like aggravating because it doesn't even show his face like you can't even tell it's him taking the piece of art Uh, 
And so this goes on. And at one point, him and his girlfriend start to have issues because this is all that, like, he's living the life. But she's just kind of like, is this it? Is this it? Okay, fine. Whatever. And so they're starting to get into fights and everything. It, it, it's just, stuff's not quite working out. And at one point, she's just like, you need to be more careful. Because they did take his prints in Switzerland the first time he got caught. It was just like, I'll never do it again. Guess how long it took him to be like, I'll never do it again. Six months. Two weeks. Oh, well, <laughs> I wasn't that far off. Yeah. <laughs> So there, there's like a lot of like near misses here and there and everything. She's just like, let's chill for a bit. And he's like, no, two weeks later, they're stealing again. And at one point, there's this bugle in Switzerland that is just like, yes, yes, I have to have this bugle. He goes to take the bugle and it's 2001 now. And so he goes to take this bugle. It's in like Luc- Lucerin. Switzerland or France? Switzerland. Switzerland. And he gets caught taking it the first time. Oh, man. And they're just like, no, don't do that. And he's like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. 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 And gets, like, let go. Then he goes back and he takes it and he comes back. And his girlfriend's just like, what the fuck? Did you at least wear gloves? And he's like, no, I didn't wear gloves. Oh, fuck. And she's just like, well, we've got to go wipe your prints. He's like, okay, can I come? She's like, no, you you have to stay here. I'm going to go clean up the scene you stay here. He's just like, can I come? Can I come? She's like, fine, you can come, but you stay out in the car. Like you're not coming in at all. So while she's in there, like cleaning up and everything, he's at the door in the window, just like staring at her. What the fuck? (laughs) Just like at the window, just being like, and there's this dude, like with his dog walking by, just kind of looking at him being like, the fuck? A little bit later, she comes running out and bolts. And he's just like, what the fuck? And he turns around and then the police show up. And take him into custody. And yes, Jade? No, I'm keep going. <laughs> and so she escapes. She doesn't get caught, but he does. And so he's taken into custody and he doesn't talk. And he's there for like a couple weeks. He's worried about his mom. He's worried about his girlfriend. He's just like, what the hell's going on? Like, where is she? What's happening? And he's just stuck there. Like, he doesn't talk about anything. They're just like, we, we know you stole this bugle. And he's like, yeah. I took it. I'm like, why? He's like, I liked it. I thought it was pretty. Like, I'm I, I'm rescuing puppies. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, oh, uh, God, this guy, like, this whole story, I'm just like, oh, my God. He's in Switzerland and stuff. And so his girlfriend goes back home and tells his mom. He's just <gasps> like, this happened. And she's like, the fuck? What? What? So his mom starts freaking out. And his girlfriend's freaking out. And the police are just like, where do you live? All this stuff. And he's like, I'm not telling you shit. And then after a while, like he's still sitting there by himself. He's not talking much about like anything. And they start showing him pictures of stuff. And they're just like, this jeweled dagger, does it look familiar? And he's like, yeah, I stole that. This chalice, does this look familiar? And he's like, yeah, I stole that. This painting, does it look familiar? Uh Uh-huh. This painting, yep, I stole that. I stole that on this day from this museum. And I did it like this with my girlfriend and everything that piece was made in blah 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 blah. The artist is blah 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 blah. Wow! Like, so like he's confessing. Yeah, he, he's he's just like, oh yeah, that's this piece. That oh yeah, I remember that day. That day was like in the middle of summer. I got looked at weird because I was wearing a coat and it was raining. But some of these pieces look damaged. Oh, and he's just like, I didn't like. I took really good care of this. Like, why is it damaged? Like, what happened to these pieces? Back in France, at the house next to the river, a man finds some jewels and like other artifacts at the bottom of the river or the, at the canal. And it goes to the police and it's just like, hey, I found this stuff. And they're just like, oh, okay. And they show pictures to Stefan. And Stefan's like, yeah, I stole that. I stole that. So the police go and like talk to his, like, they finally figure out like where his mom is and stuff. And they're just like, hey, What's going on? She's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. And they search the house. They find nothing. And she's just like, yeah, he lived here. I don't know what you're talking about. And they're just like, where's the girlfriend? The girlfriend's just like, I didn't have anything to do with this. And they go back and question Stefan. Stefan's just like, she had nothing to do with it. It was all me. She had nothing 
to do with it. The police are like, where is all of this art? Like, we're finding a bunch of it in the river. Where's the rest of it? His mom took a bunch of the paintings out of the frames and put them in the garbage disposal. (gasps) No. No! Yeah. She put a bunch of the paintings in the garbage disposal, like anything that could fit. And then she also took some of them, her and the girlfriend went out into the woods and like on a weekend in the middle of the night and burned a pile of the paintings. The fuck, dude? That's not cool. Oh my God. I'm so stressed out right now. (laughs) I'm so sorry. (laughs) So... When she found out that her son was this, like, huge art thief that stole $1.5 billion worth of art, she freaked the fuck out, threw so much shit in the bottom into that canal. There's still probably stuff down there that they have not found yet. Because of, of those pieces, he stole over 300 different pieces of art from 176 different museums across Europe by 2001. On average, he stole a piece every two weeks. Wow. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. And it was so freaking easy for him. He just like take it, put it in his pants or put it behind his back or whatever. And people are like, what are you doing? Here's my ticket. I'm going to the cafe. I'm going to have a lovely meal. Sit down and just be like, yay, celebratory meal. We stole a cup. We stole a bugle. We stole a small piece of art. I mean, uh, on a list of the most embarrassing things anyone's mom's ever done... (laughs) I know. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, I'm so pissed for him. Like, honestly. I think I have it written down some here somewhere about, like, the amount of damages that she did. And I think it's around $10 million worth of damages <gasps> to art. Oh, <clears throat> I'm so pissed. So, they go to court. During the court proceedings, whenever, like, the prosecution is talking about these pieces of art that he stole he's like raising his hand and correcting them about the art that he stole (laughs) (laughs) it's fucking awesome but he's a piece of shit but that's like like he's pulling out like badass i mean that's a baller move i mean yeah like he's totally like owning them and just being like oh yeah well um actually that was made um mm, during this time like it was used with this kind of technique blah 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 and people are like the fuck but he's so proud about what he did he's very honest with like all of the pieces that he stole like where he stole them from all of that crap but he was always really gentle and really careful with all of the art that he took because in his head in his girlfriend's head they were saving everything and so he gets three years in prison. His mom gets 18 months for the damages to the art. And his girlfriend gets uh, also three years. Hold on. <laughs> he serves 26 months. His mom serves six months. And his girlfriend se- serves 18. That's and such bullshit. Yeah. And so after all of that, and they serve their time, his girlfriend leaves him after she gets out, because she gets out before him, she leaves him, finds another dude, gets married and has kids. And as soon as he finds out about that, he is heartbroken. He's just like, I don't have the love of my life doing what I love. I can't talk to my mom anymore. That relationship's broken. They put him on suicide watch and he goes into a deep, deep depression. After he gets out, he writes a book called Confessions of an Art Thief. I could have read that book, but yeah, no. I might later because this is so interesting. I'm just like, tell me about all the times you stole shit, please. You're not crazy like me. You don't want to try to read a whole book in two days. I understand. Yeah. Like whenever he he spent two years in, in Switzerland and then was transferred to France during that time. After all of that, he writes a book and stuff and he's very open to doing interviews and talking to people about what he did because he's just like, yeah, I did this stuff. Like, look at me. Hey, cool. Yep. 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 Apparently lives a kind of a normal life until 2011. Oh yeah. Well, after, after he gets out of jail, he's banned from art museums. That's fair. All yeah, that's fair. art museums, <laughs> like all art museums. He is banned. They're just like, you're not allowed in. No, uh-uh, no, you stay in the parking lot. Even that's, that's fair, but also kind of sad because it seemed like he actually really cared and oh, really yeah. loved it. So I'm a little sad for him, but don't do shit like that. 
That's like the people who love Disney and they like go and they like try to do behind the scenes videos and then they end up getting like banned for life from Disney. I'm like, asshole, if you love Disney so much, don't be an is- like don't be an idiot. Like Yeah. That that was this dude. To go back to the mom throwing all the artwork in the river burning and shredding shit. Fucking bitch. The police ask her and they're just like, were you trying to cover up evidence and, and save your son? She's like, no, I did it out of spite. I was angry. Angry. Yeah. And the police were just like, you're trying to cover up your son's tracks. You bitch. So out of those pieces that he had stolen, 60 have still not been found and are presumed destroyed. God. Yeah. It's a fucking tragedy. Yes. So in 2011, he is caught trying to sell more art that he had stolen. And whenever the police like go and check him out and they're just like, dude, what the fuck? We're telling you like they search the house. They find 40 more pieces of art that he had taken. And they're just like, you got to stop doing this. So he goes to No, wait. Jail. So wait, is this like new art that he's stolen or is it this part of the original collection? Possibly part of the original collection, possibly more. Wow. Because at one point he's just like, I need some money. Because until 2011, he had never sold a piece of art. It was all for his own private collection. Like he did not profit anything from stealing this art. Like he didn't like take it and sell it. He was just like, I just want to keep it. I just want to keep it. I like it. I want to look at it. Wow. Yeah. And so he goes to jail again, gets out. He's convicted in 2013 and sentenced to three more years. And at this point, like he's getting a psych evaluation and they're just like, it's not kleptomania. He's just addicted to art. Wow. Yeah. Since then, he's been relatively quiet until 2019. Oh, no. And during this time, like he's written a book. He's always open to interviews and everything and all this stuff and like all this crap. In 2019, he's arrested again for trying to sell a paperweight on eBay that was stolen from the St. Louis Museum. And so the police are just like, what the fuck again? And they go to his house and they find Roman coins, pieces stolen from a Germany museum, and $163,000 cash in euros in buckets in his mom's place. Wow. Yeah. And so since then, he's still been in jail. I think he's working on another book. That's Stefan Bertweiser. I'm probably butchering that name so bad. I'd have to listen to it again. But yeah, my sources were Wikipedia, a YouTube video called The Waiter That Stole $1.4 Billion, and a podcast called Thickest Thieves, and they do an episode over him. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was a roller coaster ride, too. Yeah. Like, Damn. So let's see. So how old is he now? So he's born in 70. He's 50. About 50. About 50? Yeah. About 50 now. So he did most of these in his late 20s. That's so crazy. Yeah, because he started stealing whenever he was uh, 22. Yeah. You know what's crazy about that story is the fact that, like, he didn't try to sell anything. Nope. Until, like, the late 2000s. Yeah, you figure somebody's going to be stealing, like, works of art is in it for the money. I mean, that's, like, what always happens in movies and shit. Yeah. they, They, like, steal a diamond or a piece of art and then they sell it as soon as they can. And then they're just, like, living the life. And nobody really knows what they do, but they're just rich. Yeah. But like, uh, whenever I was researching him, I was thinking about like Hollywood heist movies. And I was just like, they get this shit wrong so bad. Because this dude's just like walking through and putting shit in his pockets. And yeah. like walking out and being like in broad daylight in the middle of the day. So he's not like dressed in blacks. Nope. Climbing up and down buildings, busting through windows, like avoiding wow. lasers. <laughs> Well, like, he did love strategy and, like, they would map out the the museum because if he would, like, walk through something and be like, it's calling my name, we've got to take it and stuff, they would probably spend an extra day or two there researching the museum, researching the layout, figuring out which cameras were fake, which cameras were real, and, like, use her, she would distract guards or somebody else, and he'd be there by himself and just being like, all right, cool, mine. See, I'm telling you, no fake cameras. Shouldn't do it. Yep. I'm so pissed at his mom for putting shit in the garbage disposal. Fuck that bitch. Oh, no. Stuff didn't help anybody or anything. What the hell? Yeah. Like, ha. Also, why would you just burn it? Why the hell did you put it in the garbage disposal? I'm sorry. I just don't see, like, maybe she was actually just pissed. 
Because, like, a sane person would throw that in the fireplace or, like, start a fire out in the woods or something. No, a sane person would return it to the museum where it belongs. That's what a sane person would do. (laughs) Make it great, Jade. I can't argue with that. (laughs) Gosh, fuck your logic and reason. (laughs) I'm just saying, like, how could you do that? That art didn't do anything to you. You're an evil bitch. How dare you? (laughs) Still amazes me. So that's kind of a cool like like he just loved art so much he had to have it that's yeah he's just so addicted to art like people are addicted to gambling or drinking or cigarettes he's just like i just have to have it interesting i that's... need it and then was famous for a while because i thought i found a bunch of interviews with him but he's always speaking french like he was crazy intelligent too like he spoke german french english huh but yeah the biggest art thief and po- some people call him the best and biggest thief outside of Ponzi schemes. So when is he supposed to get out of jail? Did you find that? I don't know. I don't know. He'll probably do it again. If he he probably that. will. <laughs> yeah. You can find pictures of him on the internet. I'm going to look at him because that's that's pretty fucking crazy. And like I said, I'm I'm kind of like fascinated by the whole like concept of like art theft and art crimes because yeah. I mean... When you think about it, it's just canvas and paint wood. <laughs> and wood. It just, but people place this like arbitrary value on it where it's just worth so much that people go through a lot of shit to like possess it. And it's fascinating to me. Yeah. Crazy to me. Well, well, good. And, you don't and have then, to go and, through that much shit to get it. <laughs> apparently not. Well, and you know. It also kind of brings up the whole, why is it okay for some paintings to be expensive? But if me, some little asshole on the street, is selling a painting and asks for like a hundred bucks, suddenly I'm an asshole. Like It's yeah. all the value that society attributes to it. Did you ever hear about the, um, there was an experiment, like a social experiment they did in New York where like a world famous violinist, like I'm talking like concert, soloist international level genius violinist went down to the subway in new york and just pretended to be a busker and play violin down there in the subway just to see how people like reacted Mm -hmm. and most people just walked by didn't even like stop or give him a second glance like a couple people like stopped and like left some money in his hat or whatever but most people just like went about their business because to them it was just some dude in the subway playing a violin like anybody else but mm. for, like really he was like a super accomplished musician so it's just i think it's a combination of the value that society like puts on it it's also i think maybe environment because if you have a painting in a museum or a gallery i think it's automatically got more value than something that's just sitting in somebody's studio somewhere which yeah. is crazy to think about psychologically too thank you for coming to my ted talk You're welcome <laughs> is this the part where i clap i would appreciate it that makes me feel better Oh my god, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. No, stop. No, don't stop. <laughs> so I guess now is the point in the podcast where we talk about what we have been working on this week. Yes. Russell goes first. <laughs> Russell goes first. Okay, I go first. I'm still I'm still drawing a little bit. It's been a bit difficult. We've had a rough week family wise this week with, with different things so that's that's kind of taken a toll also have gone down to part-time at work right now just because we're so slow i thought we had a lot more kind of going on where it was just like all right cool yeah like i've got lots of work blah 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 so i'm just i'm just diving in hardcore into the book and getting a lot of stuff done on it and rearranging my schedule to where i i have a set schedule because that's something that i perform a lot better in if i have a set schedule Okay, these are the days I'm working. These are the days that I'm going to be working on art in the book. Very cool. Yep. That's my life. <laughs> so I've been, I did research for this, this episode. and it, it, was, it actually took a lot more. Because <laughs> 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 I had no idea it was going to be as crazy as it was. But I, I'm happy. Tell me that, about it. At, that it was. And I'm, I'm going to keep looking into it. I'm going to see, because like I said, it's like now my new, like one of my new favorite pieces of art, just because it's so crazy. I'm also like working on these tombstone keepsake boxes. I got some Ew. wooden tombstone boxes from my local Michael store and I've sanded them down. I'm going to paint them, hand paint them and put them up on my Etsy shop. 
Nice. Uh, started sketching out designs for that. Very excited to see the final product. Thanks. They're ready to be painted. Well, no, they're not. I got to just sew them and whatever. Tomorrow Gesso. I'm going to start. <gasps> a couple episodes back, I had a Gesso Mod Podge story that I never told. This Tell is it. it. It's, it's a quick one. It's really fun. So we're doing collages in ninth grade and stuff. And this one girl was wondering, she had this like lidless canister of white liquid stuff that looked like gesso or Mod Podge because both of it, like whenever it's in the container, looks the same consistency and same color. And Mod Podge has that horrid, horrid scent. And so she just like holds it close to her face and goes, is this Mod Podge? It goes, <laughs> and it immediately goes, <laughs> <laughs> it's Mod Podge. It was just like, girl, why are you shoving it in your face and just like taking the deepest of like, oh, anyway, that's my Mod Podge. So she was basically <laughs> sniffing glue because that's what that shit is. So, oh, right. That's that. Gosh. Oh my goodness. Huffing glue. <laughs> yep, she totally did. Uh, I put up a new sticker on my Etsy shop. Yeah. I sold a couple things this week, which made me Ooh. happy. Every time I'm like, nobody cares if nobody's gonna buy anything. I should just shut the whole fucking thing down. Like somebody buys something, I'm like, oh, never mind. <laughs> I am loved. <laughs> it sucks. I'm so insecure. It just fucking sucks. Cause like I'm <laughs> an emotional roller coaster. Are you okay, Russell? <laughs> I killed Russell. <laughs> no, I was drinking water on the wrong pipe. Like all of a sudden, I was just like, "Oh God, I'm gonna die." Okay, but uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing this week. And besides working, which work is fucking crazy right now, I don't even want to fucking talk about it. Ugh. But Ugh. yeah, Jane knows. We're yeah, basically in the same industry, just on different sides of the coin, and she knows yeah. what the fuck I'm talking about. Ugh. Oh my God, that's actually the reason why. I have barely done shit art wise mm. this week. I have today was the first day that I sat down and did anything in like over a week. Oh man! Because I've just I've I've gotten home from work <laughs> and I've just been so just dead. Like just don't have the energy to put because my problem is is that whenever I sit down and I do a piece, it takes like all of my concentration like yeah. that like it eat like i literally go into this like it's almost like you know how when you go into target and you kind of black out and then you spent two hundred dollars well for me it's that. like yeah so like <laughs> for me it's like i almost like black out when i go when i like get into a piece and it like <laughs> takes a lot out of me sometimes and so i just i get home and i'm just like i can't I can't do anything. And even today, I was just kind of bullshitting. I wasn't really, I was, you, you know, I wasn't really doing anything like too committed. I was just kind of, you know, lo- keeping my wrist loose as it were, you know, just to. Sometimes you need days like that where it's just like, I'm not going to share this, but I'm happy I just showed up to make something. Yeah, I just played with my watercolors. Like, that's nice. all, you know, yeah, that's, that's all I did. Like, I just did, I just did like this little monster guy, so. Yeah. Wasn't, any, wasn't anything like too crazy. Yeah. All that. right. <laughs> I Yo. totally understand because I'm in the same fucking boat. You know what sucks is I have like 10 paintings in my head that I just am like, I know it's going to take a lot out of me, <clears throat> but I don't even want to start them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Fucking, fucking A. All right. Thank you for listening to the Fan Brush Podcast. Yeah. Right. Thanks for listening to us ramble for like two hours or however long it's ended up being. <laughs> I know. Two hours are well, almost three, two and a, almost two and a half hours. Yeah, our, but, our time. But there was I'm also hoping, the intermission of food. Right. I'm hoping when once I edit it, it'll be like I'm hoping it'll be closer to two hours. Hey, that's fine. It was it was a wild ride. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be looking forward to listening to this for two weeks from now. Yeah, me too. For three weeks or whatever. <laughs> oh man, gosh, that that get thing. Yeah, dude, I was. Okay. I'm not gonna lie. I was like not not reading the story, but I was like googling pictures of that painting while you were telling the story, so I could be like, uh huh, okay, that panel, okay, uh huh, that one. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gonna have reference because there's a lot of them, and I tried to describe them, but it's like unless you see it, you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna like once I get home because my phone's about to die. I'm I'm gonna go home and like look up that that painting. It's 
fucking crazy. Oh, also, if anybody's interested in going to Belgium to, to take a look at the piece, it, it is a ticketed event. You do have to pay to get in, but it's like a whopping $5. So Wow. Don't tell Stefan. <laughs> God. All right, y'all. Good talk. <laughs> Yay. Love y'all mean it. Okay, bye. 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 Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to the FanBrush Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. You can find us on Instagram at fanbrush.podcast. Until next time, keep creating. Bye.